Welcome back to 12 Days in March. This presentation will serve as introduction to the Heart Failure series of lectures. In this recording, we'll highlight key background information common to the topic of heart failure regardless of the etiology. In the subsequent recordings, we will get into the weeds on the specific disorders. If you haven't viewed them yet, you should view the ischemia and valvular disorders prior to this section as some of the key physiology has already been reviewed. And here is a summary of the topics we will be covering in this presentation in painful and excruciating detail. So let's define heart failure with an emphasis on failure. Ask yourself the question, what is the heart failing to accomplish? Did you ask yourself that question or are you changing your dating status on Facebook? For those of you who are interested in what the heart is failing to accomplish, the answer is not meeting the blood and oxygen requirements of the visceral organs. That's not good. Our organs like blood and oxygen. And this definition makes no distinction between systolic and diastolic heart failure distinguished by reduced or preserved ejection fraction. Of course, the body responds to this failure of perfusion. The neurohumoral response will be covered in the next video and is a huge topic for the boards. But for now, suffice it to say that the carotid baroreceptors and the RAA system will protect perfusion by raising total peripheral resistance. And sticking with the definition of not meeting perfusion requirements helps us to understand the concept of high output heart failure. In these instances, the cardiac index is frankly elevated, but the underlying conditions such as anemia or AV shunts interfere with the peripheral delivery of oxygen. This is the only way we can really appreciate the concept of high cardiac output and heart failure. In fact, in these conditions, it isn't really a failure of the heart, rather mitigating circumstances that interfere with the delivery of oxygen. I don't want to beat high output heart failure to death other than to emphasize it shares the common feature of a failure to adequately perfuse peripheral organs. So now that we've defined the problem with a failing heart, let's sort out the congestive component of congestive heart failure. The following discussion works best if we consider this from the perspective of reduced ejection fraction, avoiding the nuances of diastolic dysfunction and high output failure for the time being. And do note, our discussion begins with left-sided heart failure. And here's my cardiac circuit. Here we note again the failure of perfusion. Blood is not being pumped forward for any of a variety of reasons such as ischemia or valvular disease. Since the left ventricle is not moving an adequate volume of blood into the systemic circulation, there is an increase in left ventricular end diastolic volume and pressure. And that increase in end diastolic volume will be manifest or characterized by an S3 heart sound. And here are the major S3 derivatives. The most important derivative is the description of blood entering a volume overloaded ventricle, which has reached its elastic limit. So when a vignette mentions the presence of an S3, they're telling you the patient has heart failure. The other derivatives pertain to the clinical exam. They won't ask these as questions, rather they will be clinical descriptors. S3 occurs in early diastole and is heard best at the cardiac apex during end expiration while the patient lies in the left lateral decubitus position. This maneuver simply brings the heart into closer apposition to the chest wall while the lungs are relatively deflated. And finally, S3 is described as a negative prognosticator in patients with LV dysfunction, especially in the setting of regurgitant murmurs such as AI or mitral regurgitation. All right, insofar as congestive heart failure, if blood is not being ejected out of the left ventricle, it is destined to back up. We refer to this as venous congestion. And where will these congested vessels back up to? By way of the pulmonary vein, the first stop is the lungs, and this pulmonary venous congestion will be manifested clinically by Rawls. Rawls literally puts the congestion in congestive heart failure. I will again emphasize that Rawls are only seen in left-sided heart failure. The patient with isolated right-sided heart failure will not have pulmonary crackles, and this becomes a key distinction. We'll cover right heart failure shortly. So what are the key derivatives for Rawls? First note, I do mention that pulmonary venous congestion may present with a transidated pleural effusion manifest by decreased breath sounds and dullness to percussion. This has nothing to do with Rawls, but do be aware that the combination of S3 plus this clinical description equals left-sided, not right-sided, heart failure. Now turning our attention to Rawls, you should be familiar with the physiologic basis for the fluid extravasation. 
This results from an increase in hydrostatic pressure, as one would expect in a patient with elevated left ventricular and diastolic pressure that is being transmitted back to the pulmonary circulation. The other key derivative focuses on rust-colored sputum. This is fun for them. It generates downstream pathology derivatives. It goes like this. Why is the sputum rusty? That's easy. Delicate pulmonary capillaries can rupture due to elevated hydrostatic pressures. What happens to blood that is leaked into the alveoli? Like all things, red cells are taken up by alveolar macrophages. When the macrophage accumulates sufficient aggregates of ferritin, this is referred to as hemosiderin. So heart failure cells develop and are referred to as hemosiderin-laden macrophages. The iron will stain positively with Prussian blue stain. And here's how they play the game with those hemosiderin-laden macrophages. They describe a patient being discovered with them either at autopsy or on lung biopsy. You will need to work backward to identify their significance. And their significance can be identified by any of the following descriptions, which highlight either the underlying pathophysiology or the pathologic basis for the reduced LV function. You can't answer these straightforward derivatives on test day if you don't identify the hemosiderin-laden macrophage as a consequence of LV failure. Let's keep working backward from the left ventricle and that elevated end diastolic pressure. We reviewed the S3 and pulmonary venous congestion manifested by Rawls, but now we can actually measure those pressures. To do so, we'll use a pulmonary artery catheter, also called a Swan-Ganz catheter. You can see the wedge pressure, and I've noted that the pressure is elevated from baseline. So what do you need to know about the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure? Although it is used to assess LV end diastolic pressure, in reality, it is measuring the LA pressure, which, in most instances, indirectly reflects left ventricular preload. The operative phrase here is, in most instances, but not all. But as a general rule, and in LV failure, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure will be elevated. And here are the representative pressure tracings as the balloon is advanced from the right atrium into the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. The balloon is literally floated out to the pulmonary artery where it becomes wedged in a distal pulmonary artery vessel and there it measures pressures which are reflected back from the left atrium. In congestive heart failure, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure will rise reflecting the elevated left ventricular end diastolic pressure. So whereas this is true, it is a rare question where the NBME uses the wedge pressure to inform you the patient is in congestive heart failure. They don't really need to they can give a clinical vignette with Rawls and an S3. So how do they use the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure? Here's the biggie. This was already discussed in our mitral stenosis video, but let me reiterate while we are on the topic. In mitral stenosis, the left atrial pressure will be elevated, but beyond and distal to the stenotic valve in the left ventricle, the pressure is normal. Got that? In mitral stenosis, the left ventricular pressure is normal. It is the left atrium that is impacted. So as the stenosis becomes increasingly severe, LA pressure rises, and this is reflected back to the pulmonary venous circulation. The wedge pressure will be recorded as elevated. And to illustrate this point, this is how a question might be phrased. Patient has shortness of breath. JVD and Rawls are present. Note, there is no S3 mentioned. They then describe an elevated wedge pressure with normal LV pressures. Then they ask you the derivatives, assuming you're able to identify the disconnect between wedge pressure and left ventricular pressures. This combination of high pulmonary capillary wedge pressure and normal left ventricular pressure should permit you to make the diagnosis of mitral stenosis, address the underlying cause of this pathophysiologic derangement, and or select the expected physical exam finding. These are all fair derivatives. All right, the other instance where the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure shows up is in ARDS. ARDS is also referred to as non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. That is, pulmonary edema is present due to capillary leak, not elevated left ventricular pressures. Consequently, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is low or normal. I like to say the low pulmonary capillary wedge pressure puts the non-cardiogenic in non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So they'll reference a patient with shortness of breath and lots of crackles. They can then ask you to choose the correct pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, or more likely, they'll give you the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure and ask you to identify the underlying disorder, such as ARDS, 
with a pathogenic mechanism such as capillary leak secondary to inflammatory mediators. And finally, to wrap up this discussion, I do want to highlight some key differences between right and left-sided heart failure. Whereas the hallmark of left-sided congestive heart failure was pulmonary venous congestion with S3, Rawls, and elevated pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, right-sided heart failure is devoid of these features. Of course, the findings in right-sided heart failure depend on the underlying cause, but the common pathophysiologic description will include an elevation of the central venous pressure as opposed to the pulmonary venous pressure of left-sided heart failure. So how will this be manifest? The first manifestation will be an elevation of the jugular venous pressure. This is discussed in more detail in the tricuspid regurgitation video, but for our purposes here, you should be aware that the jugular venous pulse is a reflection of the elevated central venous pressure. It is certainly influenced by a number of factors, including the performance of the left ventricle, but the jugular venous pulse is a measure of right-sided pressures. This is an important distinction. And while in the neighborhood, you should be aware of the determinants of the three positive pressure waves on the JVP waveform, including the A, C, and V waves as labeled. And as you can see, those elevated venous pressures can be reflected inferiorly through the inferior vena cava, causing both hepatic congestion and peripheral edema. As with pulmonary venous congestion, these findings also reflect elevated hydrostatic pressures. Although this will be reviewed in the liver section, you should begin familiarizing yourself with the concept of congestive hepatopathy, which again reflects the hepatic manifestation of the elevated right-sided pressures. The classic description is that of the nutmeg liver with the pathologic description of central lobular hemorrhagic necrosis. Fancy stuff to simply describe that blood is backing up into the liver. And it is here where we will cut our losses on this presentation. In the following presentation, we will highlight the physiologic response to heart failure, which is a rich source of derivatives for the NBME. In our final set of videos, we'll review the specific entities and cardiomyopathies you will need to know for the USMLE Step 1 exam. If you have any questions or concerns about any of the material presented in this video, please drop me a note at 12 days. Nice chatting with you today.